this is going to be our first real structural example of uh, dealing with these critical buckling loads. And we're going to take a look at uh, the bridge structure that is historic. It's quite old, right, over 100 years old. And as is often the case these days, where we like to repurpose structures, and we don't want to just tear them down, but find another way to use them. We're curious about, well, what's its real strength now that, especially, you know, 100 years after this construction date, we do know a lot more and a lot better about overall structural performance. So we're going to take a more realistic look at what's what's going on here. Okay, so <clears throat> this truss that is um, that long and, and, and that high, right, so it's 25 foot panel widths, so that's 100 feet long and 40 feet high here, it has these three very heavy loads. Remember this originally was a, a truss that was supporting a, a train. <clears throat> and so these are very large loads coming from the, the train kind of situation. And we're going to look at figuring out what the applied stress is in member AH, that's this compression cord member over here near the support. And we're going to find what the Euler stress is in that member, right? That's the strength, and we're going to find a factor C. So this is all about a buckling uh, concern that we might have in that particular member. Now, <clears throat> when this steel structure was created, the uh, steel that they used at that time was classified something close to the A7 steel. That's a big, large grouping of steel. It's a medium steel, has a yield, tensile yield strength of about 35 KSI, an ultimate strength in the 60 to 70 KSI range. It didn't have a, a great amount of control on the properties back then. Better on the yield, but not so great on the tensile, hence why there's a range there. Now this top cord, member AH, was comprised of two steel channels that then had a cover plate. And you're seeing a perspective drawing of that. This is the transverse floor beam that goes in and out of the page up here at A, right? So the train tracks would then be going across this way. And this is this diagonal that's coming in. Right? And that's that top cord that then comes down to, in this case, the, um, the abutment or the pin support. And you got the bottom cord I bars that come in here and everything's connected with that big gigantic uh, four inch pin that, that, that connects all that together, right? So we're gonna look at that number right there. Right? So let's turn the page over here. And when you look at closer in at the details, here's our two channels. Right, and we've got this cover plate. There's your 18 by 3 eighths, and then there's some lacing that goes along the bottom that keeps those channels from bouncing in and out on us. It sort of stabilizes it. But we don't want to come along necessarily put another big cover plate because A, we may not need it. B, if we do that, we close this all off, which means that if there's corrosion that's happening, we can't see that. So with this lacing that just goes back and forth, just diagonals that crisscross back and forth along the length of the member here, that that creates a open air situation allows then no moisture to necessarily collect in there and, and we can see it if there is some and, and any sort of corrosive effects right now they did this back then because they needed significant compressive strength that they couldn't get out of just say a single channel that was available so they were clever and creative and they built up the cross section to have the kinds of strengths that they wanted so we got these two channels in this this cover plate Right? And we're going to find the applied axial stress in the member, which means we're going to go back to statics and basic truss analysis. And with this particular geometry and the set of loads, we find out that that member needs to be able to support a demand of 240,000 pounds in compression. Right? Make sure you go back and review that and you can get the, the same number. Now, in terms of the axial stress, it's pretty straightforward. We just go figure out the total cross-sectional area, look up the area of the channel in steel tables, and then the area of the plate is not something you'd ever look up. It's just a rectangle, so 18 times 3 eighths of an inch, and we have then the 26.75 square inches. So just basic applied axial stress in the member sigma equal P over A, and we get about 9 KSI <coughs> of a demand. Right now, for the Euler load here, that's going to be our, <clears throat> remember, our P sub E equals some version of a pi squared EI over length squared. Or if we do that in terms of the radius of gyration, then that would also be expressed as pi squared E R squared A over L squared. 
And if we want the Euler stress, then <clears throat> that would be sigma E equals PE over A. Oh, well, that's just pi squared E R squared over L squared would be an, just another way to uh, manipulate, work with these critical expressions that we have. Right now, the critical thing is we got to calculate I, the second moment of area. And the, the critical thing here then also is we've got to get then, well, does this thing going to first buckle about the yy axis or buckle about the xx axis? That's going to be influenced by, well, is ix or iy the smaller or the larger of the values, right? So uh, we know where, and we can find where the centroid of, of the cross section is, right? It's easy in the yy because it's symmetric about that one. So that's not a a, a big problem, but we do have to go through the act of figuring out where the centroid is, and we find out it's 5.94 inches down from the top. And from that, then we can apply the parallel axis theorem then to come up with what the uh, appropriate second moments of areas are, right? And you're going to find out that Ix is equal to 929 inches to the fourth, and Iy is equal to 1014 inches to the fourth. What happens is when we design this kind of built up cross section, we're typically trying to decide what the dimensions are and select sizes so that these two numbers are about the same. It means that we'll have about the same compressive strength in both, um, both bending axes or, or buckling axes. <clears throat> right? And so that's within 10% of each other. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, we could fuss around and move this around but you know the, the iron workers do not want you to tell them i want a plate that's 17.825 inches wide they, they don't want that kind of nonsense you, you've got e typical increments that they're going to be interested and willing to work with that's easier and quick and less expensive for them to do so that's why you know if you go look at this at 17 and a half it'd be interesting to see well what would change here, right? So if that was 17 and a half, this would shrink a little bit, which would make this a little bit smaller for IY. On the other hand, making that plate smaller is going to make the Y bar go down a little bit, which is going to make the IX go up. So maybe 17 and a half would be more balanced. Don't know why they chose to do it this specific way finally, but that's what they have. And that's what we're working with down here. Um, all else being the same, this thing is going to buckle about the x-axis for the whole system um, and not the, the y-axis, right? So let's go to that part here. So let's find the Euler stress for member AH. We're going to assume that we have <coughs> um, the same bracing length in both directions. That may or may not be a good thing to do, right? So let's take a look, though. Our... Uh, P sub E value would be pi squared E I over L squared. Our Euler stress would be sigma E equals pi squared E R squared over L squared, right? I is the same thing as R squared A, take the A over and divide it through and that gives us the stress. And so we would need that radius of duration, which we haven't uh, found yet, but we need the smallest one, which is just going to be you know, again, R squared equals I over A. So whichever is the smallest I value, which was the X axis, is the one that we want to work with. So then that would be, <clears throat> let's see, that was 929 inches to the fourth. Our area was, uh, I think, 26 point something or other, wasn't it? 26.75 inches squared, right? And so... 929 divided by 26.75 inches of the fourth over inches squared would be inches squared. So 34.7 inches squared for the R squared value. So that's already been put in there. So pi squared times our E value. Now this is um, steel that's been around for uh, a long, long time, meaning we we found that the value of E for most steels, even historically, is about the same. Now, the older you get, the less likely it's that 29,000 KSI is the appropriate value, but it's not too far off either. So if you had data that told you that there would be a better number to use, you would go ahead and do it. 
30,000 sometimes, I've seen even as low as 25,000. The properties were just a lot less controlled back then. So we've already squared the radius of gyration. In fact, we never found the radius of gyration, we just found the R squared value. And we gotta go find this length, right? Well, come back to here. We've got, well, let's see here, 25 foot wide panels. And so that's 25 foot, typical all the way, 40 foot here. So that means 20 foot there. And that means that square root of the sum of the squares being important, 25 squared plus 20 squared. Did you do that right? Yeah. That'd be 1025. So the length here would be square root of 1025. And we're going to square that, right? So we already have that squared value is 1025 square feet. Well, we don't want square feet. We want square inches. <clears throat> so 144 square inches per square foot. And what are we going to get here? Pi squared times 29,000 times 34.7 divided by 1025 divided by 144. And we get a value of, that's quite low. Ooh, wow. Equals 67 point. Well, I don't know. Is it really that low? Wow, wait a minute. What's our units? All right, so we got to check out some things here. That's kits per square inch times square inch. So that's kits on top. And we have feet squared go away. And we have, oh, we have, wow, oh, this is a stress, not a force. All right, so kips per square inch there. All right, now I'm feeling a little bit better, right? Because our factor of safety with respect to the Euler stress then is going to be our, whatever our critical stress is, divided by our demand. And in this case, we had a critical value of 67.3 kips per square inch. Our applied stress, remember, was about nine kips per square inch. So the units are all the same, dividing through, and 67.3 divided by the nine, and would give you a factor of safety of 7.5-ish, which is you know, quite large. Um, there's some other factors that are at work here in terms of the real member and its strength that we are also eventually going to have to consider. And one of those is going to be the slenderness of this whole system. Right? And so we'll get into that in another video, but slenderness is the length divided by the radius. Right? That's your radius of gyration, that is. That's the slenderness ratio. And <clears throat> note, we see that right up in here, right? That we could rewrite this as sigma e equals pi squared e over L over R squared. It's a nice non-dimensional thing. How skinny this is matters quite a bit, right? And double the slenderness will take the strength and we'll reduce it to a fourth of what it was, right? Double here gets squared, that's in the denominator. So that's going to turn out, that slenderness ratio is absolutely a critical uh, kind of aspect to us. And note here something, sigma E was 67.3 KSI, but the basic yield stress that we're working with, assuming that yield stress and yield stress and tension and compression are the same, which is reasonable for most metals, but not always good. Um, but we have 35 KSI, which means that we would never be able to get up to this elastic buckling load before we would start to yield the thing. So we'll come back to that um, in another uh, lesson.